Hey folks, my name is Kevin Abdurrahman. You know me as the man inspiring millions, a motivational speaker, public speaking coach to world leaders, the advisor and strategist to gaming, NFTs, and metaverse projects. Kicking it with Kev today is an investor, advisor, content creator, collaborator, and the founder of Zen Academy. You know this man, the man who has taken the world of NFTs by storm, Zeneca. How you doing, my bro? I'm doing very well. That was a hell of an intro. Thank you so much. After the initial F up. <laughs> we don't talk about that. <laughs> oh, man, I'm all about it, man. You got to be with it. Yeah, right? <laughs> of course, of course. Man, a few things that we do share, I'm not sure if you know or not, but a few things that we do share is the love for food, mm. um, n- not working 24-7, and getting a good eight-hour sleep. Now, I'm a big believer of all of the 100%. Above. Yeah. A hundred percent. I just took the weekend off, like pretty much fully off work, which was amazing, except I, f- I sort of forgot that the world, and especially the NFT space does not stop. So you come back after a weekend off and it's like, oh crap, I have 400 DMs and, and emails. And But yeah, I agree that it's important to take breaks and sleep. Yeah. What got you to these realizations, you know, because today I'm at a stage in life where I appreciate these things, you know, I appreciate good food. Mm. I appreciate not working 24 seven because at the end of the day, why am I doing it? And Mm. I appreciate good sleep because my body just doesn't function, but it would be cool to figure out like, how did you arrive at these points where you've realized these important things in life? Yeah. I mean, the sleep is easy. I can really pinpoint that to, I think like two, two and a bit years ago, I read a book, why we sleep by Matthew Walker. It's very, it became very famous because it was like the book everyone was talking about. And he really highlighted the importance of of sleep, of getting seven to nine hours every single night and how it, it just 99.9% of people cannot function properly and effectively on less than that. And just really went through the science and broke it down. And so ever since reading that, I was like, all right, let me make this a priority. And I did for a while and just felt infinitely better because prior to that, I was, you know, I was not doing that. I would routinely get three, four hours of sleep for ages and every now and then I'd sleep for 12 hours. I'm like, oh, I'm caught up now. And that's great. But that's just not how the doesn't, it works. doesn't work that way. It doesn't right? work yeah. that way. Um, so that's that element. Nice food, uh, like eating well. Uh, I've always liked that. Ever since I was like 18, 19, I was a professional poker player. And when I come into a little bit of money, I was like, oh, let's go to a nice restaurant. And, and you know, my friends are out clubbing and, and partying. And I was not that, into that that much. I would go to a nice meal, eat some nice sushi or something. Um, and yeah, work-life balance. I think I spent so much of my twenties, sort of, because I played online poker, I was sitting behind a yeah. screen twenty-four-seven um, and not living, and it just wasn't that enjoyable. It was, yeah, it had ups and downs. And then coming into my thirties, um, so I'm thirty-three now, and like, you look good, man. Realized, Respect. <laughs> yeah, it's got enough grays here, and I've got some grays here, but um, it's all part of the look. You look good. It is, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I just sort of realized that, you know, what's it all for if we're not enjoying life? And I do work a lot. Like I, I work, I don't know, 80 hours a week or something crazy, but I love it. So it's, it's like, I love it and I can take time off when I want. I work for myself. It's like, it, it's a different type of work. And, yeah. you know, if it gets to a point where I'm like, I'm very cognizant of the fact that if it ever stops being fun, I'm just going to take a step back. And I can, I'm fortunately in a position to do that. And like, you know, before things got crazy with launching Zen Academy and doing all this other stuff, I was working less and I was fine with it. So, yeah. Yeah. You, you were a poker player in a previous life. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, yeah. 15 years, pretty much okay. 15 years. Yeah. What made you good? And I guess it's a two-part huh. question because, you know, I'd like to know what made you good and how has that translated into what you're doing hmm. these days? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, a lot of people ask, you know, how how can you be a good professional poker player? How can I be one, et cetera? And it's not about intelligence because there are people way smarter than me that just tried and failed or didn't even get close to succeeding as a professional poker player. I think it's like a very certain specific set of, you know, intelligence traits and uh, personality traits and skills. And it's, it's things like um, having patience, having the right temperament and not going on tilt all the time um being able to withstand like the emotional fluctuations of winning lots of money and losing lots of money and dealing with that uh and the stress of that and shit this sounds uh, like the nft business 
Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so exactly much of that, like yeah. especially during it for 10 to 15 years, um, it just became second nature to understand like the swings of all of it. And so coming into NFTs, and, and this is probably why there's a lot of ex poker players in crypto and in NFTs, because the transition is very seamless and there are a lot of parallels and similarities. And like one of the most important things is what I call a healthy, um, uh, like healthy disassociation to money. So when you, when you're playing poker, you're sitting at a table um, and, and you're making a big bet, you're thinking about calling a big bluff or potential bluff. Uh, you don't, you, know, you shouldn't think about what that money can really do in real life. If you're thinking, oh, that's rent money for a week. Oh, that's a car. That's a holiday. That's food. It's, it's really difficult to separate the emotional from the logic and, and make good decisions. So you get to a certain point where you don't care too much about the money, but you still have to care a little bit. You can't just completely not care. Otherwise you just don't care and you just spew and just do crazy stuff crazy stuff all the time. So I think having that fine balance where it's like you, you understand that money is sort of a tool and, and a resource that you use to make decisions and hopefully accumulate more chips, more money. Um, but it's, it's not completely valueless. It's not play money. There still is at the end of the day, something tangible associated with something very tangible. So you, it's finding that right balance where it's like, you don't care too much about the, the money and the swings, but you care a little you bit. It's enough. the same. It's yeah. the same. It's like ETH. ETH is play money. It's, it's for a lot of people. It's like, you know, everyone says the joke, oh, I would never, I, I can't imagine spending a thousand dollars on a new iPhone. Hey, that's 0 0.3 ETH. Oh, okay. Or 0 0.4 now. <laughs> um, yeah. It's just like, oh, okay. Yeah. Or like whatever it is, when you start breaking down something, it's like $30. So like, oh, it's 0 .000, 000 ETH, whatever ETH. It's like, oh, that's nothing, but still $30. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad to see there's a lot of folks. It, this has become my way of thinking, man. I literally yeah. had a tr I had trouble spending I don't know four hundred bucks on a winter jacket. I'm like I can't do this, man. I can't justify it. Like it doesn't matter, right. you know what the amount of money is. I just can't justify it. I'd rather spend it on food, coffee. Like my denominator is a cup of coffee, and I'm like that's a lot of coffees. Yeah. And then I thought, hold on a second, man. A couple of nights ago, I just spent more in like a failed gas transaction. I'm right. Like, it's it's gas. Jacket, yeah. Dev. Yeah. <laughs> you need the jacket. Yeah. It's it's it warps our sense of everything, and I think. Yeah it's really easy to um, lose control. Like it, because you warp sense of everything, it's easy to go and spew infinite money in real life or to yeah. spew infinite ETH. And that's, I think, again, where having the experience as a poker player has helped me um, a lot. And so what was the transition for you going from, because I mean, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is three lessons you learned in 2021. So hopefully we'll circle back to that question mm. and I don't forget, but what was the transition you were doing poker and obviously if you were doing it full time for 15 years you were pretty decent right you well, know you don't you don't survive I, I, not being decent well there's a popular what saying in poker you you um you don't need to be good at poker you just need to be better than the people you're playing against so so you yeah, take your table I, wisely yeah i mean to begin with i mean obviously and especially to do it that long you have to be somewhat competent and early on when i was playing on primarily online I was, I would say I was quite decent, but then as time got on, the game got more solved. People were getting smarter, you know, younger generations and younger kids were coming up and they just had, they're they were just smarter. Yeah. They're sharp and they were using, you know, advanced tools and figuring out the game theory. And it was like, it was getting tougher and tougher and, and just the game was getting more solved. So I was, you know, I tried to keep up and I, I could hold my own, but then it was like, well, or I could just find different tables and different games where the play average level of play is like less sophisticated. And so I did more of that the last say three to five years of my career than, than actually sort of being excellent at poker or anything like that. So what you did was it's a smart business strategy, right? You, you did the blue ocean. You're like going, Hey, hold on a second. If I'm here online, it's a red ocean. Like everyone's here, high competition. Just from a business strategy, you assess your strength and weaknesses and you go, let me go and find a small niche, a different place. And pretty much, case, yeah. Right? Yeah, 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 pretty much. And I think like game selection and table selection is sort of a, is a skill in poker. And it's like, it's not, it's not enough to know how to play well. You also need to play well. And then you also need to pick the games and then manage your bankroll and manage your emotions and all sorts of other things. So I think picking the games you play in is just one of the skills of a poker player. And um, 
yeah so I, I did that the last three to five years it was playing like live in-person games and then also a couple of online sites where there was a lot less volume but when there were games it was a lot easier for me at least i have this problem man when it comes to nfts you know my i'm always i pretty much just got all in so whatever is in that wallet yeah. i just got all in and i've been told yeah. many times and i know this right you should just just take it easy but it was the same problem with poker. You know, one, I lacked the patience. And two, I was constantly going all in. I'm like, yeah, not the game for you, Kev. Yeah, yeah. It's patience is, is really important in both poker and NFTs. Um, so what, what was the transition? And I, and I guess then perhaps, mm. you know, the, the story of how you came into the space and then as you evolved, what were the lessons from last year? Because it was a big year for you, 2021. It was a big no year. Doubt. Yeah. Um, well, the transition. So it was uh, February last year, February 2021. I had a one of my friends. He's I've known him 15 years. One of my best friends. He, he's my podcast co-host, Jamie. Uh, and so he was a poker player as well. And he asked me, have you ever heard of a hash mark? And I was like, no, I've never heard of a hash mark. And then he eventually started telling me about them. They're actually hash masks. He just got it wrong. And then he had some mutual friends who were sort of into NFTs and crypto and were spending thousands and thousands of dollars on JPEGs. And I, for like a couple of weeks, I was very convinced it was a scam, some Ponzi, some cult. I didn't think too much about it, but when it was brought up, I was like, oh, are they, are they still, you know, wasting money? Are they still, you know, in this cult scam thing? Um, but eventually I, I, I read, did some research and read some articles um, that really changed my mind about it all. I, it sort of explained the tech and the, and the creator economy and the possibilities of web three and all of that. And then, yeah, that was like late Feb, early March. I sort of made a conscious decision to just pivot from poker to spend, like, because I had been around crypto a little bit in 2016, 2017. I dabbled, um, but I was never fully all into it or anything. And then I sort of realized again, February, March, that, you know, there's a tremendous opportunity here. Um, let me just try and, and, I guess, capitalize on it or like just, see how it goes learning about it and there's so much to learn that there's just so many things like even stop. before nfts just learning about metamask and gas and DeFi and liquidity pools and like I, I literally made a list that was like this long of like just terms and words i had never i had no idea what they meant and then i was like all right let, let's let's take some time and, and f figure these out one by one and it was a couple of months of yeah just figuring out all of that and um yeah, at the same time, I eventually started buying a few NFTs and it was fun. And, and that was, yeah. And eventually the NFT market just started going a bit crazy. And some of the things I bought started going up and up and up. And then I was flipping them and, and just, yeah, head, head first into this crazy, crazy world of flipping NFTs. What was the difference between, say, someone like yourself and someone like me, where you, you bought, you know, your first few and they've, they've gone up and up? As opposed to say, I just caught, I think I'm just average, right? I, I bought a whole heap of stuff and I've just gone down. Like, what, what do you think is the difference? Do you have an eye for it? Is there something that helped you uh, navigate, especially as a novice? Luck, probably. A lot okay. of luck. Fair enough. I mean, yeah. I mean, some of the things I bought early on did not do well. Some of them did. It was luck to not sell the things that did well before they started going well, mm -hmm. things had gone down 50%. I could have very easily sold them. Um, it was luck to yeah, just a ton of luck. Uh, I think it can't be understated. Um, Man, one of the yeah. things I really like about you is just, you're so candid about it, right? Because very often it's just so easy to go, oh man, you know, I saw this, this was <laughs> strategy, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. such, I'm so switched on. I just saw this and I just picked up on it. I was having, you know, I was having a chat with, uh, a friend, Danny, who's the co-founder of Alluvium. And I'm just going, mm. hey, man, I can just be upfront with you that I never saw the 100x last mm. year. And he's like, same, right? He goes, yeah. we've made bets. We thought they're going to do well. They didn't. And a couple that really just caught us, you know, just completely left field. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was definitely luck. And then I, I think as time went on, I started to get a little bit better at identifying what maybe had a better chance. Like, in terms of there are certain patterns at a certain point, there's basically a point where you could mint almost anything and then flip it for a profit. Um, yes. But it was definitely luck that got me to that point to have enough of a bankroll, to have 
you know, money to, to spend on minting whatever random project and then being able to flip it. Um, and then once you yeah. start understanding this, because I feel for someone that's watching this, it could be a founder of a project. You know, I'm heavily involved in, in the gaming and metaverse arena. I unfortunately meet a lot of founders who come with very good intention. Um, they've got solid intentions and they can back it up with solid work because often they're, you know, mm. X AAA from, you know, somewhere else. And yeah. they're coming into this space, but they're failing to understand what I've come to realize is the critical point. It's not your investors. It's not your partnerships. It's not your skill of what you're building, right? It's an element of community or something, you know, that you've done extremely well in terms of understanding and, you know, picking. Mm. Um, I guess perhaps a few things and you can take this in any direction. Like when did you come to realize how important community is? And then what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, when you're looking at projects, how do you assess whether this project could have a good shot at things, you know, not financial advice, but just when you're doing your right. personal assessment. And then we can, I'm saying all this because I tend to forget all my questions. And then we could lead <laughs> into, if you're a founder and you're starting off fresh and you want to build a community, what would be some tips? So we yeah. Circle back. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, let me preface this by saying so something that came to mind when you were going through that. And it's basically, it's not that difficult to create an NFT project. It right. really isn't. Anyone can do it. The, the difficulty is getting people interested in it and building that community and forming that community and getting people excited about your project compared to the thousands of others. Um, when did I first, I think perhaps without really being super conscious of it, it was the Bored Apes that really sort of got to me. Although before that, I, I was in another community called Ape Only. It, it was like another ape project that minted like a month or two before, maybe a month before. And there were only 999 of them and it was cool and fun. And there were like 20 of us in the discord that were really active and yeah it was really i, I really was enjoying it in there and, and it was one of it was literally the first nft community i was a part of and i think um when the apes came along i was like very stubborn i was like hey i've already got an ape project why aren't pe more people interested in this one this one's great people should be buying this it should be pumping um and so i really stayed away for like a few weeks but then it was uh so honestly the reason i bought into the apes was fomo it was just like i was on twitter uh, one day and like literally everyone was talking about him and I like i had never witnessed that before in the, the space it was just like everyone was going crazy about the apes and, and i was like all right this is crazy this community is strong this community is powerful as mm -hmm. ape follow eight i i feel fomo i want to be a part of it and then i i, I went on open i bought one and then i felt like i need to buy another but i didn't have enough money because it was like 0.5 eth at the time and i i was like illiquid um and so i had to actually deposit Australian dollars into my exchange in Australia. And then thankfully it, it all moves really quick and then withdraw it to my MetaMask and then buy a second eight. Um, and because I, again, FOMO, I really felt this power of community. I was like, I want to be, th this is something different. This is something strong. There's, there's some network effect. There's something going on here. Um, but obviously it hadn't quite dawned on me then how important and powerful community was as a concept because it was sort of this newish thing that the board ABO club had just not, I don't want to say invented, but they, they really uh, reinvented maybe is the right way to say it. The, the concept of NFTs doubling as like a, a membership token, a club access right. to a club, this community thing. And then, yeah, after that, we saw the gutter cat gang that launched, seemingly like three weeks later, it was very shortly after they did much of the same thing. And a lot of the power of that was, again, you know, I was in the discords, I was hanging out in there and I, I could see the vibes. I was like, people are really excited. And this is, this is important. And the same thing happened with the Zen FT bonsai trees. And then, you know, after that more and more projects and I started saying, all right, so this community thing, there's something here. Um, and then fast forwarding a bit, like what, what do I look for in terms of, projects that might make it more likely that this community would form it sort of comes down to the team and the project founders and i think who they are as people and what how i think their abilities might be to cultivate such a community and it doesn't necessarily mean that they come from a triple a gaming studio background they have 20 years experience uh in whatever field it's sort of personality type and trait and like are they friendly are they um are they do they get it? Do they, are they like mm. web three native? Are they in the discord with the community? Are they, if you're a project founder and you like 
you say I don't like Discord and I don't like Twitter, it's very difficult to break into the the NFT space specifically. Um, maybe it's getting a little easier as the space grows, but it, especially back then, you really needed to be, at least in my opinion, boots on the ground, you know, in the Discord all day, every day. Yeah. Yeah, because you spent a few hours a day, right? Speaking with a whole heap of founders, right? And now I do, yeah. Every yeah. single day I have, I'm looking at my calendar right now, three to six hours of calls, 15 to 45 minute calls with different project founders. Right. And like I'm on, on the phone, I think at least on average 10 to 12 hours a day, just on calls speaking to different founders. What, mm. what are some metrics that you're looking for? Like, you know, you, you mentioned a couple perhaps, yeah, you know, their personality trade, are they native? To the space like a red flag for me is if, if a founder is not on the call i'm like if he's not on a phone call and he's sending another team or if they say we're ha- we're hiring a marketing agency to handle our community i'm like you just don't get it you really don't get mm. it because i know that as a community member like if zen academy is run by zeneca i appreciate that every now and again that he's actually in the discord mm. it's just me right it's just every simple day. as that right yeah and so if that's the thing of how I feel and that works for me, like I'm assuming it's going to work for everyone else, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess thankfully most, almost, yeah, almost every call I have is with project founders who already understand that, you know, if, if they're launching a project, they, they need to be in the space. I think one thing that people um, underestimate is the importance of building out your own personal brand and network. Because as a project founder, it's important that other people sort of, I think it's important that other people know who you are, know what you're capable of. And like, it's very difficult to get crazy excited about a project, especially these days, if you can't have a little bit of an insight into who's behind the project. And I think, uh, yeah. And, And again, it comes down to a lot of people just don't use Twitter and Discord and haven't. And that's understandable. I didn't use either until a year ago. Like I, I had a Twitter account many, many years ago as a poker player. And then I stopped using it for ages, hated social media. I'm still not the biggest fan of social media, but I understand that it's it's necessary to, it, it, and, and it's a very good way of sharing information very quickly and being part of this community. Um, and, you know, there's upsides and downsides to social media and to Twitter and to Discord. Twi- Discord is not a great platform from a, like a software perspective, especially for what we want to do with it in Web3, but for better or worse, that's what the NFT community has called home. And Twitter is is sort of the place where people, crypto enthusiasts converse, I think largely because um, there was a lot of like anti-crypto sentiment from Facebook and Instagram. So people were like, all right, let's go to Twitter. You know, Jack Dorsey is behind it. He's a Bitcoin, you know, he loves crypto and, um, it's sort of, that's how Twitter, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is our, this is our platform. And then, um, yeah. So it's sort of understanding how important Twitter and Discord are to the ethos of this entire space. Um, I think is, yeah, I think I've, I've veered off course. I don't know what the no, question is. No, no, it's all good. But, but like, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all good. But say if a founder is watching this, right. And they go, okay, cool. I realize the importance of building a community, knowing what you know today. Like what would be some tips you'd give them in terms of like how to use Twitter and Discord, at least just as starting steps to be able to build out a community? I mean, yeah, I mean, starting steps is literally just download the software and get used to it. See, see how to use it. I'm assuming that most people understand the software and can figure that part out. Um, the one thing, the thing that I tell, I literally say this 10 times a day in every single call I'm in because everyone has the same question. It's like, all right, we built a project. How do we get other people interested in it? How do we get other people interested? How do we market it? How do we build our brand? How do we grow our brand? Um, and the same, I say this exact same thing every single day. It's the best way to do it is to spend 16 hours a day, seven days a week for a month or four on Twitter and in discords, part of the community, not mm-hmm. in your discord talking in other discords about your project, but just everywhere in the NFT space, in the community. So people get to know who you are and understand that you've been here for a while, that you're here to stay, that you have something of value to add, that, that you're, you're just in the, in the space, that you get it. You will not know what it's like until you, you, you just won't get it unless you're 
part of projects when the founders rug pull and you're in the discord and you're seeing the panic and the, the FUD, you won't get it until you're part of some hyped gas war mint when thousands of people are trying to mint and then the gas spikes like crazy and people are fudding and people are ecstatic and people are flipping. And it's just like, you, you can't get that experience without actually getting that experience. And the best way to do that is spending 16 hours a day just 24 seven, if you can, like, I know that that's contradictory, but you know what I yeah. mean? Just all the time. And, and then, all right. So, and then people say, all right, well, I can't do that. Cause I have all these other things to do, you know, 16 hours a day. And I say, well, then just spend as much time as you can. If you have a, a spare five, 10 minutes here and there, um, instead of checking the news, instead of scrolling Facebook, checking Reddit, whatever, jump on Twitter, reply to some tweets, like, it's one thing to doom scroll and stuff, but really to actually get involved in the conversations, you'll get, you'll, you'll start to get noticed and people will see you. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. That's how I built my brand. That's how I've seen so many other people build successful brands in the space. Um, I spoke with Voltura from Psychedelics Anonymous on my YouTube show a couple of weeks ago. And he was talking about how, you know, he grew, so he comes from a marketing background and then he, he decided to launch an NFT project with some friends and it came relatively out of nowhere. And people were like, how did this account grow to like 200,000 followers, 150,000 followers? Basically he was just, so he took it to the extreme. He said for three days, nonstop, he was just awake <laughs> and, and just on Twitter. And he literally uh, DM'd every single person that liked commented or retweeted anything he did and so he had a couple of tweets that, that blew up a little bit and he said over the course of this three days he, he personally dm'd thousands of people and not like a copy paste thing he was sitting there on his phone just typing just typing 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 and reaching out and just saying hey you know i saw you you, you commented on my tweet nice to meet you blah 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 blah, blah. make nice. some personal connection maybe 20 percent of people 30 percent of people replied maybe out of that 10 percent keep the conversation going on you know, a few thousand people, all of a sudden you've got 500 people who have like had some interaction with you, you know who you are, know that you're launching a project. That's, that's a lot of people. And then it's sort of this network effect where it's so much easier to snowball and have this flywheel effect after you've got 500, a thousand people then starting from zero. And so getting from zero to that point, it's a ton of grinding and hard work. Um, and it, it usually takes months, but you, you can accelerate it by going absolutely crazy in a short period of time. But yeah, there's just no substitute for immersing yourself. That's what yourself. it is. Yeah, there's no substitute for immersing yourself and just putting in, you know, the hard work. I, I really respect that, man. You know, people, they don't see that. Like, they'll see, oh, wow, <clears throat> like Psychedelics Anonymous, yeah, they had a, a sellout mint. Mm. Yeah, but did, did you see the day one effort, which, you know, what you highlighted? Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so much of that happened. And, and yeah, so much of that happens before and under the surface that people don't see and it's yeah yeah like a very nice meal it's, it's easy to see it right at the end <laughs> right where you just don't see all the cooking that goes behind the mm -hmm. scene yeah uh, man a few questions because i think this applies to any founder or builder um how do you keep your sanity and how do you manage your time hmm. like how do you have that's a certain like you know protocols that you implement just to help you so you're not having to think on a day-to-day -day basis you can just follow a routine i'm in the process of like getting my systems and structures set up i'm not great at it um i i think the, the best way like how i manage my sanity is i've accepted a couple of things one is that i'm going to miss 99.9% .9 of stuff that happens in the space that's just a given you have everyone has to do that or you'll go absolutely insane so i'm like okay i'm i'm okay missing a mint i'm okay if i see a project decide not to mint it it goes 100x's like that's fine i've had i'm fortunate i've had success focus on what i'm building what i'm doing now great um i think that in terms is of is there systems, a way sorry man is there a way to yeah. accept this because I like to think that I've come to accept that I'm going to miss 99% as well, but it always hurts. No, it still hurts me. Like yeah. I read this newsletter, I don't know, a couple of months ago on the concept of like infinite regret. And it's like in this space, there is going to be infinite regret that you feel from every direction and it doesn't stop. It doesn't end no matter what, how much success you find, you know, no matter how well you do, there'll always be at least for a portion of the time, some part of your brain that goes, Oh crap. You know, Oh, I feel bad. Oh, I wish I did that, but I knew that was going to do well. Why didn't I do that? Or, or you hold something too long. It's like, oh, why didn't I sell? I got too greedy. This is infinite regret. Um, yeah, there's no way it's to just a, a daily self-talk. 
kind of yeah it's just like there's no way to fully overcome it but it's sort of constant vigilance i guess it's just sort of ensuring you don't um and, and this sort of goes back to like bigger picture stuff it's like how can you be more like mentally well stable confident you know as like eat well exercise meditate go to therapy um whatever it takes to yeah be in a good mental state um which helps as a as a base point i apologize man. Yeah. i cut you off you're you going to tell us about your systems right yes so yeah again i don't have any great systems i i sort of block out certain times a day for meetings with project founders that i'm advising and consulting on and like i've got that nicely set up so i wake up and then for the few hours after that like i have my coffee and a few hours after that meetings and then i have a few hours that are like i try and keep as family time me and my fiance and you know we'll walk the dog and, and stuff like that have dinner and then and then it's sort of like a free-for-all at the moment like i, I my, my calendar just gets fully booked out, you know, a week in advance. And I'm like, I, I check it every day. I'm like, all right, that's, I got that stuff. I'm, I'm in the process of like building out my team and like building out Zen Academy and delegating more and, and hiring people to help manage everything. Um, but it's a process, you know, it's like on the one hand. Yeah. I mean, I, I think every, every person who's in sort of a managerial position or like a, whatever position who has to, like a project founder or creator who has to you know give up control or ownership it's like well if you're a perfectionist it's like hard to do because you're like well you have to trust other people to do to you know take care of your 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 baby your child that you've sort of created over a long period of time but at the end of the day it's it's about finding the right people trusting them and then yeah taking a leap of faith and and yeah, yeah. I mean, in the Web3 economy, you can't have a baby, right? It's never your baby. It could start off as your baby. Yeah, but exactly. The whole ethos of Web3 is you have to let go. Exactly. Exactly. 100%. 100%. Yeah. 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 Um, what, what, are like a, what, what are some transitional failures you see that people well, can, give me about can transitional avoid? Failures. So say, for example, like, you know, like what I mentioned earlier, uh, folks coming from, say, AAA gaming, coming into the web three economy and thinking that I'm just going to focus on building, right? Community mm. is going to take care of itself. Mm. I'm going to build and they will come, which to me is, is a total failure because I don't think it even worked in the AAA gaming. They're just coming with, with an illusion. So I see this as mm. a very and easy to see transitional failure. Do you see any of this in your space, given what you do? Cause you're involved with art and you know, bits and pieces. And then I, I do want, I've got a few art questions. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the biggest failure, it, it's very much closely related to that. It's just uh, underestimating the importance of networking. So mm -hmm. again, it's people think if you build it, they will come. If I create great art, people will buy it. Um, unfortunately, that's usually not the case. It, you still have to get, you still have to market it. You still have to get it in front of people's eyes. You still have to get, give people a reason to sort of, you know, be interested in it and to believe in you and the project and the art or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, I mean, just again, like the traditional world, so much of the space runs on who, you know, and networks and, and all that kind of stuff. The beauty of it is that networking is no longer this stuffy thing that you go to conferences and people are in ties and suits and you have to listen to an hour of boring keynotes or whatever to, to network. Just you to just, have a 15 minute networking. Yeah. Exactly. You just, you, you, you just scroll Twitter, you jump into a discord, you jump into a Twitter space, you jump into a game. Like there's, there's games now that people are playing um, and people are so friendly and warm and welcoming and happy to help and, and, you know, elevate each other and collaborate. And the beauty of it again, is that there's, there are so many like win, 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 win situations in this space where everyone can kind of win. Um, yeah, it's just about doing it uh, and and reaching out to people and and yeah. Unfortunately, there is still a lot of uh, yeah. You still need to network, unfortunately. Or fortunately, everyone wants, yeah, yeah. Everyone wants the results, but you know, without putting in the effort, right? You got to die to yeah. go to heaven, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, when you touched on art, it uh, reminded me that you're a bit of a connoisseur. You know, you you, you picked up on artworks, Fidenza. Uh, a whole heap of other things. I'm by no means anywhere close to out of, out of mm. 100. I'm below one. So I have no understanding of it. Evidently, I missed all of that. Uh, but I, I noticed, and because I was following you from, from the early days, that you had picked up on the likes of, you know, the, 
the art blocks. Did I say artworks earlier? Artworks. You said artworks, yeah. <laughs> artworks is a paintbrush here. Uh, art blocks, you know, the Fidenzas. How did, how did you pick up on it? Uh, how did it do? And I guess I'm leading this for someone like me who's missed them, or I feel like I've missed it. Do I wait for a re-entry or, and, or how do I pick up on the next narrative or the next trend? Help me out, Zeneca. Yeah. Um, I mean, to answer the first part, how did I pick up on it and all that? Again, luck. Like <laughs> it really does come to, down to it. The, the second thing I minted or the second NFT collection was art blocks because uh, a friend in a group chat that sort of introduced me to NFTs was saying, uh, just posted we had this we had this group chat with a few of us and he was like these look cool they'll probably be worth more in a few months you should admit and it was an art blocks drop and yeah i mean i was like i didn't know how to find projects at the time there weren't that many projects dropping i was like all right basically i would if something was open for minting i was like because i was i saw nfts like hey these are cool these are fun i want to get involved i minted a few they look kind of cool uh, i was never and still don't consider myself an art connoisseur or you know any, any expert in that i've definitely grown to be a lot more of an art collector and appreciator but um back then especially i was like again just 100 percent drawn to it because of the money he said all right these will probably be worth more in a few months you can flip them i was like great that, that's exactly what i want to do um and then they sort of they went down in price and for like a good couple of months they weren't they were trending below and i think i sold a few below mint price um but that sort of got me introduced to the community and then i, I noticed that some of the drops were going up in price and that you could flip them pretty consistently and then, uh, yeah, I, I was just, again, locked to be in that position, right place, right time, being part of that community. And then it, it just eventually blew up. And I was like, yeah, right place, right it time. To me, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's an element of luck, but like you get a, a bit of luck, but you're willing to like hang in there, be in there, pay attention. That's what I, right, sense right, that yeah. I get, right? So you might be handed a little bit of, of good fortune, but you're really making the most of it by by picking up on it and going, okay, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to pay attention to what's going on. And then you come to your realizations. Am I correct in that yeah. assessment? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again. Because I could have uh, a lot of luck come my way, right? In terms of like passing, yeah. you might go, hey, Kev, you know, you should check this out. And then, but I will ignore it, right? Or I just look into it and then the, within, within five minutes, I step out of it. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to get too existential here, but then I'll be like, it's lucky that I was in a position that I said, all right, I'm going to stick around with this one and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, that's how I first found it. And then our blocks obviously blew up so much in like July, August last year. It's since come down like 90, a lot of collections, 90%, but they're still higher than like by a lot than when we were first getting into them. Um, you still do I your think... Excel sheets? Not so much. I kind of stopped them start of this year. It was just getting to be too much to, hectic, to yeah. do. It got hectic. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess in terms of finding the next one, finding new art, new artists, I think. So the golden rule for art blocks, for art in general, has always been buy what you love. Like at the end of the day, even if you're coming at it from a profit mind it, it's it's very difficult to purely think you know what art is going to appreciate and it, it's such a high risk volatile environment that coming fr from it from that perspective where you as long as you love it if the price is tanked to zero then worst case scenario you can hang it on your wall you can appreciate it right. you like it um so that's still the advice buy what you love and can afford is like the golden rule of art blocks or my golden rule of art blocks i think that's a good golden rule of art nfts in general and probably art in general um or even again, nfts like, in general right i think yeah, it applies yeah, yeah. to just about any nft yeah yeah i think um the best way to like find out the next one or whatever the new opportunities are is again just immerse yourself in the community follow artists find art that you like join their discords artists will often have discords talk to other artists see who they follow you know you can go on twitter and see who this artist is following who are they tweeting at and commenting on and replying and then eventually you'll just find new artists who maybe have not been in the space very long and are releasing things that are quite cheap and you're like oh i'm gonna pick that up and then you notice four months later they've blown up and stuff like that yeah you want to go in before it's news ideally yeah 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 um man i don't want to take much of your time because i know you got a call coming up but i do have a few more questions 
No, um, I've got about 20 minutes left. Yeah. What's your, what's your insight or hypothesis for the coming year? Because like, it's hindsight. <laughs> hindsight is 2020, right? You look yeah. back and you go, boom, 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 and it's all just perfect. But I mean, it's all, that's why it's a hypothesis because nobody knows. Right? But how are you going to navigate 2020? Like in terms of like seeking out trends or opportunities, like to position yourself. I, I'm asking this question, like if I, as an average person, just want to position myself in the best way possible to maximize this opportunity, because we're really at a zero to one moment, right? I still mm -hmm. feel that we're in a zero to one moment. Perhaps from your insight, someone like me is able to do that. Yeah, I think um, it's it's just it's obviously a crazy year, a crazy period with the war breaking out between Ukraine and Russia that has really thrown everything into turmoil, a lot of panic in every market. Um, I think that the I just NFT want to market. Say just here, I'm sorry for cutting you off, but I really just want to shout out and um, just show a lot of respect to you and also, you know, your the course that you've got with NAS Academy. Mm. Um, perhaps you could share also, you know, what it is that you're donating 25% of the proceeds, if I'm not mistaken, for Ukraine and this issue, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me get into that quickly. So I did a course with NAS Academy, which is um, sort of like a masterclass style website where any a lot of different creators or experts of various fields can create these like video courses. And so mine is on how to launch an NFT project. And it's very much like 101, obviously to launch a successful NFT project is very, very difficult. And I just sort of talk through some of the things like marketing and people to hire and, and stuff like that. Um, anyway. Yeah. So we, we shot that last month. It'll be released next month and it's, it's a paid course. Um, it'll be free for anyone who holds a Zen Academy NFT or a 333 club NFT. But um, for everyone else, it's paid uh, three to $400 depending on discount codes and where you are and stuff like that. Um, but my percentage of the proceeds from that, I'm taking 25% of that to donate to support Ukraine, various charity awesome. initiatives. And then the other 75%, I'm, I'm putting into a fund that I'm calling like a scholarship fund, um, basically a Zen Academy scholarship fund that we'll use to support up and coming artists um, and creators in the space one way or another. It hasn't been fleshed out yet, but um, I've set up a whole new wallet basically so everyone can track it. It's all, it's a whole beauty of blockchain. You can see it's all transparent. So 25% um, will go to uh, support Ukraine initiatives and then 75% might be supporting artists from Ukraine. It, it could be something, yeah, anyway. You'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. And then I guess the idea is to continue adding to this um, this scholarship fund through other various initiatives. Sometimes I like advise projects and they, they pay me either an ETH or some percentage of sales revenue. And I think it would be cool to advise and then take that and put it into this fund, which can just go back to the community. And anyway. Um, Respect. Yes, the question was, was your, how are you going to navigate? Oh, this year. 2022, yeah. yeah. Um, so coming into 2022, had this thesis that which still might come true that the market would the nft market i guess specifically there are these protocols coming out which allow people to take on loans and liquidity using the nfts as collateral mm -hmm. and, and they're, they're just sort of just starting to come to market now they're largely focused on blue chip nfts something like crypto punks maybe board apes as time goes on, I'm, I believe that they will extend to more and more collections. My hypothesis or thesis was that um, once these become a little more mainstream, there'll be this sort of mass unlocking of liquidity and, and prices will sort of ramp up across the board, but it will also lead to the biggest crash we've ever seen in the NFT space. Once the market starts to turn and people really panic and start getting liquidated because we haven't really had the possibility for people to leverage themselves in the nft space yet there's sort of like peer-to-peer -peer loans through things like nft fi but it hasn't really become instant and easy um and i think it's going to and i think it's scary uh, and so my hypothesis was that we'll see some crazy run up and that sort of <laughs> when i've sort of been I, i've never really liquidated a ton of nfts or anything i've sort of just been slowly accumulating and selling off bits and pieces when, when prices go up but never a lot but i think if if i see that happen i'll, I'll probably be very panicked and sell a lot that's your sell signal yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we're going, uh, January came, came out of the gate with a massive bull run. And then we've sort of been slowly bleeding through most of Feb and now most of March. Um, we've seen this a couple of times before, twice last year, I think. We saw maybe three times these mini bull bear cycles. Um, 
who knows what's going to happen. We might just continue bleeding and, and all our projects will go to zero now. But yeah, I'm still bullish on like really legit projects and collections that are building things of value. I, I think because I spend so much of my day every day talking to project founders and people working and building in this space. And there's so many cool, innovative, new things that are bringing real value to the table that I, it's difficult for me to be bearish or anything but very bullish on the entire space. Um, but obviously in terms of short to medium term market cycles and fluctuations, anything can happen. So uh, long story short, I think we continue to fluctuate most of this year. We probably see a massive blow off top and a massive crash um, that is larger than what we've seen in January, February, March. Not financial uh, advice. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, yeah, this is not financial advice. We're just yeah. mates having a chat. But I mean, I guess a last question then. What's your suggestion as a mate um, for you know, someone like me who's not very good at, who's very good at entering, not very good at exiting? Mm. Right? I guess the entry is the easy part. Exiting is tough. Uh, so right. January, me and mates, we were just calling it, hey, this is high. This is the peak right? At least as, as a mini cycle, mm. right? This is not going to last long. And we just talked about it and we let it go. And today we're talking, yeah. and we're going, we said this was the peak in January, mm. right? We talked about this. We were, we were saying that this is really high and it won't sustain. Mm. And yet we failed to exit. Um, I do, think, do you have um, any tips for folks? Like yeah. Me? I think like 90, 95% of people will fail if they try and time the market and swing trade and, you know, buy low, sell high. It's so easy in theory, but it's very difficult to consistently do over and over, especially when you factor in uh, gas, transaction fees, um, open sea fees, royalties, tax. It's like, it's, it's, you need to be beating the market by a significant margin and you're competing against lots of other people and people are getting smarter and I, lots of money is flowing in. Sure. But I, I don't think most people can successfully do that. And I don't even really try to do that. Um, yeah. But say not so not timing the market, right? Because I don't see mm. myself at all. Like if I'm in the bottom 10%. Like right? mm. I'm just I'm upfront about the realities. Like I'm going, hey, this space has got heaps of smart people. I'm in the bottom 10%. Yeah. It's important to realize your strengths and weaknesses and just play accordingly. Mm. So if I'm in the bottom 10% and I do understand that picking the top and bottom is something even the pros can't do. Mm. Would you do you recommend a strategy of going when it's here? Look at exiting. You know, the idea is to have gunpowder to survive mm. right? and be able to enjoy this process long term as opposed to just burning out, not mentally, but well, I guess when you don't have anything, you end up burning out mentally. Yeah. But, so you're unable to then play, right? Because if, you, if you're locked up and you're illiquid. Yeah. So, I mean, to quote Warren Buffett, uh, be fearful when others are greedy, yeah. greedy when others are fearful. So, like, when the market is really afraid and bleeding, buy you know and then when things are going crazy maybe sell but try and buy things that you have a lot of long-term conviction in and mm -hmm. so that you don't feel like you have to sell at a certain point and sort of uh, another quote i can't remember who said it but uh time in the market is more important yes. than timing the market so, so i think good. especially for nfts which are so new and and i think going to be so revolutionary some of the things that last several years are going to be worth even from here 100x plus 1000x um find projects that you have a lot of conviction in buy into them ideally when sentiment is low um and, and understand just stay. that it could just stay at zero too right it's just or exactly it could yeah it could it could stay at zero it could, could go below zero you could have a lot of conviction and then it comes out that the art was stolen that the founders um aren't who they say they are that they run off with everyone's money whatever there's infinite ways that things can go belly up sec could come in and, and shut something down or you know there could be far there could be another war a worse war nuclear war could break out there's infinite so i guess just take another step back is don't spend more than you can afford to you lose yeah. i understand this is extremely risky high risk volatile um you know, have a balanced portfolio, have some amount in stables, in other crypto, have stuff not in crypto, have it in whatever other asset class that, you know, buy some whatever, potatoes, <laughs> canned goods, something to survive. That's the true. Yeah. Um, but no, seriously, like diversify. And then of the amount that you do allocate to crypto and NFTs, um, 
use that to have convict put into projects you have conviction in yeah and be patient don't, don't feel like you need to FOMO into projects just because other people are um yeah we're going to see yeah many, I mean, many, many more market cycles yeah yeah i'm mean, one of the tips that i got um following maddie dcl blogger right he mm. was um and and i really liked it and then i've come to realize how smart the move is he goes i don't necessarily mint right i'll just wait for the project to mint or bent out, so to speak, and then I'll see what it's doing in terms of community. Mm. And then he tends to pick them once he sees some solid volume. And mm. I'm like, hey, this, this is this is a good move, right? Why risk into necessarily going into the mint, not knowing how things are going to be? Why mm. not weigh it out, you know, or wait it out, and just see? Does a community form? Is it bubbling up? Are there, you know, is, are the sales mm. consistent? And then you can go, okay, this looks like it's pretty good. Sure, your entry might be higher than mint price, but you've considerably dropped down your risk. Mm. Um, yeah, no, risk to that, that's a really good point. And I think uh, as time goes on as well, minting is just, it's just going to change. It's just yeah. the, the, the way it's set up where, you know, there's a limited quantity, five, 5,000, 10,000, but so many people want in and, and yeah, uh, I think that's a pretty good approach. And also like identify projects that you think are, that you want to be in. And maybe have like a wish list and say, all right, if it drops below this certain price, you'll buy in because whatever, there's FUD, the whole market crashes. And then if it never drops, maybe you miss it, but you, you'll get enough at, at, a, at a cheap enough price that you'll eventually uh, ideally do well long term. Good piece of advice. Man, I don't want to hold you up. Any parting thoughts? Um, piece of advice or lesson or something for folks um, to take away with? I would just reiterate what I was saying at the start about how important it is to immerse yourself in the space. If you want to find success in whatever area it might be, whether you're a project founder, whether you're an investor, whether you're a collector, whether you're an artist yourself, um, whether you want to find a job as a developer, as a, a content creator, as a moderator, community manager, as a marketer, whatever you want to do, the best way is to just be in the space, immerse yourself network like i literally like 10 minutes like two minutes actually before we jumped on this call i was reading a dm from someone who spoke about how he just got his dream job because he wrote a twitter thread and he doesn't have many followers but just the right project community saw it and was like hey we want someone to help with our branding our marketing or, or like a messaging stuff. whatever it was a twitter thread like just Man, that's awesome. putting yourself out there networking is so valuable um yeah that's good stuff Network. man that's good stuff very we're cool. friendly <laughs> yeah hey yeah. man this is the beauty of the web3 economy right folks are super helpful people are friendly and like you know this tip is just extremely powerful if you got nothing out of this just this last point right here right just go out there and get involved in any capacity you know this mm. twitter thing is a great example right it doesn't matter how many followers you have but you show exactly. the caliber of your work and then the right audience will come to you um, yeah but you and, have and to, yeah yeah I was going to say, and maybe, you know, 99 times of a hundred people who have 200 followers write a Twitter thread, no one's going to notice or see it, but do it a hundred times then. Like it's, it's, it doesn't take that much time. If you really want to be in this space, seriously, just keep consistently consistency and persistence and repetition, like so important to everything in this space. Yeah. Man, solid advice. Um, folks, I hope that, um, you would have got, I have no doubt, you would have got some you know, gems out of this because Zeneca is, is full of insights. Make sure you're following him. Uh, but I hope that even if you walk away with one piece you know, or one thought, uh, that you will get inspired, get informed, and get going. Remember, whoever you are, wherever you are, be kind, be ambitious, be grateful. Man, I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. I those yeah. are some great parting words. Yeah.